In this video, I will describe some of the basic features of Gerbil Crew Lathe, where to find it, how to install it, how to explore some of the basic features that can be used on a two-axis metal type lathe. I'm primarily using this under power with its motor, but at the end I uh, use it with a closed loop stepper driver. Where can you find Gerbilgru lathe? If you go to the gerbilgru.com website, you will be presented with this page. There are two products on offer, Gerbilgru Mill, which I cover in a different video, and Gerbilgru Lathe. The most stable version is version 1.0 at the present time, and the most up-to-date beta is version 1.1. If you click on one of these, you will get the download, and that should show up in your download folder on Windows. This is a zip file, and you can see the little zipper in the folder icon. If you right-click on that, you will be presented with this box. Most Windows program have an extraction selection, so you can extract the files from the zip folder. There's only one, and that'll be put into a folder of the same name. Click on Extract, and that'll happen. So here's the folder, Gerbil Grew Lathe Installer. I've chosen the beta, and inside is the installer. Double click on that, and as you click through the boxes, this will install. Here is Gerbil Grew Lathe. I've chosen the My Lathe machine because it's simple and it resembles my own. As with Gerbil Grew Mill, the layout is the same. The largest page is the simulator. Get that back. And to the left are the various choices that you have. So in configuration you can choose the type of lathe that you want and there's several there. The port will come in when you attach to your controller. I don't have one attached right now, so I will leave it at simulation. The lathe tool you can select here. I usually use a thin 2 millimeter tool for my purposes. The work position is indicated here. And the buttons to control movement are below that. This control panel is how you start and stop any programs. The buttons work the simulator just as they do in Gerbil Grew Mill. The important difference is in a lathe the orientation is such that left to right movement is the z-axis. In and out movement is the x-axis and if you're using the spindle in this case this is the y-axis. There's also a milling lathe program in Gerbil Grew Mill but I won't cover that in this video. Gerbil Grew Lathe is designed as primarily a two-axis metal lathe and uh, that makes things a lot simpler in many ways. I don't have a card hooked up currently but if I did I would normally choose Gerbil Hal and there's a variety of cards that are compatible with that. The Gerbil Mega 5X is compatible with an Arduino 2560 card. The Gerbil V1.X is compatible with Arduino Uno cards. Arduino Unos can control three linear axes, but 
it is possible to make them work with a rotary axis. And I will come back to that later in this video. But that affects this y-axis right here. But for now, I'll stay in simulation mode since everything can be demonstrated with that, including running the G-code. Basic movements in the simulation screen to see different views of your lathe are either through the pre-programmed buttons at the top, which will give you different views from the front, from the top, or from the end, or this standard view. The mouse wheel will allow you to move in and out. If you somehow lose yourself, the little magnifying icon there will take you back to a standard view. I prefer looking from the top because that's how I see my own machine. If you hold the left mouse button down and draw a rectangle and let go, that'll zoom in on that area. Lathe tools can be chosen in this little box and there's a limited number uh, and they show up on the screen as what they are. I usually will use a shape D or a parameter tool that I've defined that's very long and slender. I don't use jaws and holders and things. To move around is pretty standard using the buttons to go left and right, to go in and out, and to get back to a zero position or starting position you would click on the center one. To load a simple DXF profile and to play with it, there are a number included with this program and they're under the import DXF and they show up in the Gerbilgru lathe example data file. So here's the DXF file. There are a number here that are also included with Gerbilgru mill that won't work well. For example, I used the bat DXF and that won't work at all in this. But chess king or chess pawn or chess rook, for example, are suitable ones to play with. So as you see, it brings up a rook and it's made a three-dimensional image of that. I'll get back to where I was. This is a little ways away from the chuck. So what I can do is move the z-axis to the left and call that my new zero. Move it a little more. There's no purpose in this. The machine will work the same regardless, but for simulation purposes maybe you want to see it work that way. You see a number of lines already drawn here and this represent a automatic job that's been created by Gerbilgru Lathe. If you go to the 2D panel, you can see that job. If I hit this, you can see the outline of the rook and Gerbilgru Lathe has already drawn some lines representing how it will move the tool. In the job templates, that one is auto start, and that just starts up. So in this job, you can see some of the things that have been already set for you. It won't go any smaller than a radius of three millimeters. Everything is in millimeters in Gerbilgru lathe. Rough is the roughing pass. Here's the in-feed depth. If I want to go a little less aggressively, perhaps 1.5 millimeters, 
you see in the window the number of passes has increased. I can change the feed rate to something slower. Perhaps I want to go to 100. Rapid feed rate is here. And the finish path is down here. Perhaps I want to go only 0.1 millimeters. If you add that with the offset in the roughing, that'll mean two finishing passes. You can see that if you zoom way in, you see the two finishing passes here. Now they don't exactly follow the outline of the template because Gerberger lathe has to deal with the size of the tool that's been uh, selected for use. The tool is selected down here and that's about all you need to worry about at this stage. There are a number of op other options you can play with but I will leave it at that for now. So if you zoom in on this, the job is all set. You can look at the G-code if you wish. It's all created there with, uh, with the different values. You don't have to be bothered with that. You see it will go outside of your, your outline a little bit and these are actually adjustable within the program. But to run this one to experiment, I'll turn off high speed simulation and start it. The tool will work in doing the roughing cuts. And then I'll go back and do its series of finishing cuts, 0 0.1 millimeter depth at a time. If you watch the tip of the tool, it actually follows the outline as well as it can. So that's the automatic tool creation. It's gone back to zero and this project is done. You may decide that you want to customize this a little more than what the automatic job selection will do. But if you try to change the, the tool when that job has been created, uh, it basically won't let you, so then you have to do it the long way, which is really rather easy. So, similar to Gerbil Grew Mill, to get rid of everything, you press the big red X and everything will go away. All the data is deleted, your DXF, your job is deleted. So you want to load a new DXF file to play with. We'll, we'll import the same one. It is important to know where to find these just in case you get lost. So if I'm sitting in my Windows C selection, scroll down to Program Files using your mouse wheel, open that up, go down to Tow, and here's my Gerbil Grew lathe that I'm using. In the data is the example data. And this is where all your files will be. So here's the DXF file. And I wanted, say, the chess rook, as I used before. I'll open that. It does automatically generate the job. But I can go to the 2D file, open up the Jobs tab, highlight that with a left click, right click it, and delete it. So there's no job for that right now. I can set up a new job for this outline by right-clicking to get this selection box and create a job. In my case, I want rough and finish. 
So rough and finish will bring up a very similar job as auto did, but the default has no roughing pass, so you select that and press yes. I want an offset of 0 0.2 millimeters from the outline, and I want an infeed depth of 1.5 millimeters. The feed rate, the plunge feed rate is all right. I think the plunge rate feed rate is a bit too fast, so I will slow that down to 100. And the rapid feed rate I'll slow down to 500 for now. The indent right and left, don't worry about that. The infeed depth I want is 0 0.1 millimeters, so there will be two passes. And you can see that the program has selected similar to the first run what I want there. Now that I've clicked that you see two finishing passes. Now I want to change the tool. Right now the default is the parameter tool. If I pick the two millimeter one I get a narrower parameter tool that you can see over here. But I've gone and created a custom parameter tool to match up better with a tool that I am using. And it has a flat outside edge, a radius here, and then uh, a similar flat inside edge, but I can't make that yet. That's all I have to do. This job is created, so we can go back to the 3D screen and run this and it'll run just the same as the first example. In actuality, when you're hooked up to a machine and you get feedback from the control board, it won't be going this fast. There it stopped. So let's take this simulation to the workshop and see how a piece cuts out here. This is a piece of poplar dowel. Poplar is not a particularly good wood for this purpose, but it's cheap and very available to experiment on. I'm just raising the camera a little bit so you can see a better angle. The cutter that I'm using is quite a specialized cutter with a 2 millimeter tip width, and it's made for aluminum, plastic, and wood. The edges are very sharp down the left side, around the tip, and down the right side. I have this video going at a normal speed so you can see the uh, action a little more clearly. I could have speeded up the, the cut speed a lot more, but that sort of defeats the purpose. These are just clearing cuts. I bring in a vacuum to clear off some of the sawdust. biggest challenge with milling wood in general, and popular in particular, is to get a decent surface finish. 
this particular style of cutter, which is meant for aluminum, is the best kind I've found. The standard cutters for steel are just too blunt to work on wood. This is just doing the final rough cuts. The fuzzies that you see are not a problem. They go away now that the final finishing cut is being set up. As you might imagine, my little lathe had no problem cutting this poplar. The speed is about 1800 RPM. The finish always looks good on a spinning piece, but in a moment you will see it slowing down. A harder type of wood like maple or cherry would probably give a better result. The surface finish is actually not too bad for poplar. Quite sandable. Here's a close-up photo. So you may say that's fine to make chess pieces and candlesticks from Gerbil Grues supplied files, but I want to make my own stuff. So I'll show you how to do that. This is VCarve available from Vectric. This is a popular computer-aided design program. I've also done the same thing on Onshape, which is free if you allow your files to be public domain. So in this program, I'll create a new file. I make sure it's in millimeters. I've chosen 300 millimeters square arbitrarily. The important thing is the XY datum position is right in the middle of the workpiece. I click OK and I'm ready to go. I'll draw a simple line starting at or pretty close to the origin and I'll make a little Christmas tree. Now I angle the lines so that the cutter will be able to get at all aspects of this little tree. If I make right angles of the wrong shape then the cutter won't be able to get in there. And it doesn't matter how exact this is for my purposes. So that's my little tree outline. That's all I need. I will export that as a DXF file and I'll put it here in my image files. Save that. Bring up Gerbogru Lathe and I'll import that file. Here's my outline, and Gerbil Crew has made a three-dimensional object out of it. And as you saw earlier, it will generate a automatic toolpath for it. I can go in and edit that, and have a little more aggressive cuts. This is two millimeters. That would work fine. These are a bit slow, so I would probably speed this up for the size of this piece. Put this up to 500. And then for my finishing pass, I would leave it the same. The parameter tool of two millimeters will be fine for this demonstration. And as you see, that has been created my start diameter I've arbitrarily made 80 millimeters and that's enough to encompass this whole piece. And if I start that, after setting my workpiece zero point, then away it'll go. There's high speed simulation. As it works through this project, And I think you get the idea, so I will stop it right there. Get rid of everything. 
So I made something that's a little more practical for myself. Don't want to save that. I made a Morse taper too. So I hunted down the dimensions for a Morse taper and uh, converted it to metric from Imperial, which is what I found. And I made this outline. So this is the distance. This is the diameters. I only need half of that. So I copied it down to here, snipped off everything else, and just kept this half and added a little straight portion right there. Then I selected that and exported it as a DXF. So that's in that same folder that I've been using under GerboGru. I have a lot of folders. my image files and here's a Morse Taper 2 in millimeters DXF. So I'll go back to my GerboGru lathe and import this. I also made a Morse Taper 3 while I was at it. There's my Morse Taper 2. I'll set my stock width to 30. It's important to measure exactly what your start diameter stock width is. Uh, mine was actually 31.3 and that matters because a Morse taper is so exact. So if I set that at 31.3, click somewhere else, then that's set. You can see the path has been outlined there. I'm right at the tip of the work on the stock so I could set my work be zero point and that will go. And that will produce a very good Morse taper. So here we are in the shop. I'm using a 8mm button cutter that's also made for aluminum and I'll show you the production of this Morse taper in real time. This button cutter it has the same very sharp uh, upraised edges as the other specialized cutter I was using but for something of this simple a shape and a button cutter is just fine. I'm running it at the uh, same slow speed that I ran the other example so you can see what's going on and to maybe get a little bit better finish on this poplar wood. In order to get the Morse taper exactly right, your measurement of the starting diameter of your workpiece has to be exactly right and entered in the program as I previously mentioned. I didn't uh, program any, any uh, withdrawal after making the cut or clearance distance because as it comes along on the surface it's like a spring pass in metal and I might get a slightly better finish. This little lathe of course has no problem cutting this poplar with this very sharp button cutter. I haven't tried aluminum or steel since my work is primarily in wood. The button cutter should work for aluminum. You would have to use something more suitable for steel, I think. 
then of course the passes would have to be a lot more shallow. I'm not a machinist so I can't offer any advice on that one. So here the machine is lining up for the finishing pass. I only have one finishing pass. And at this point it's doing a taper cut. This is fairly easy to do on a metal lathe, but there's a whole lot more setup. And as you see in real time here, this is cutting a Morse taper 2 in wood in just a few minutes. At this stage I'll turn off the motor and let it slow down so you can see what the finished product is. I'll pull back the tailstock and show the Morse taper on my live center. Just so you get an idea of dimensions. And it looks pretty similar, but the proof, as they say, is in the pudding. So I'll take that piece out of the chuck and try to set it in my tailstock and in it goes. I'm trying to twist it to get some of the dirt from the tailstock to transfer onto this Morse taper. I'm just going to lock that so it doesn't move. There's no play in there at all. And here's a close-up picture showing fairly even coating of dirt. Gerbil Guru has some other functionalities that are quite useful that you can find in 2D templates. For example, Chamfer will bring up a basic Chamfer file. There are some parameters that you can change in here. If you click on one of them, you get some indication of what that is going to be in the lower part of the screen. If you right click on the window, create a job, rough and finish, then Gerber Guru Lathe will create the appropriate G code and passes, which of course you can adjust on the main screen. You'll see it's made a 3D model of what's going on. I'll adjust that to the top view again. Now you notice that the path has not applied itself to here and that's because we haven't hit the set workpiece zero point. There it's applied. Now the start diameter is listed at 33 millimeters here. If you had larger stock, for example 40 millimeters, click somewhere else, then it'll adjust. I'll get rid of that one and go back to a different 2D template, radius. This is commonly done. You can see the outline that's appeared here. Perhaps you do want it to look a little different than that. Adjust that one and you get a little tighter radius. Once again you can create a job. Rough and finish. and look at that result and once again this seems to be detached from the model it's because you haven't set the workpiece zero point this will start as uh, you might expect you can alter the tool you can alter the number of passes how much finish passing goes on as I've described before I'll stop this here I could continue it if it was just paused, or I could just exit and then send everything back to the start point. The other 2D template is Sphere, and you can see what that will produce. So that's some additional useful functionality in Gerbo Brulez. Another functionality that Gerbil Guru can do is threading. 
and once again you go to the 2D templates in the 2D window and select threading you get a basic uh, outline here and you can change the values here so if I wanted a six millimeter thread with one millimeter pitch and 20 millimeters long and that's how that would be done you have to go next to create a job and you do that in the window with a right click to get the selection box and select threading girl Guru has already created the program and changed this to a d-shaped bit which is 60 degrees suitable for metric threads and Gerbil Grew at this time only does metric threads. Now my stock is too big. It's 10 millimeters here. It's best to have this as close to what you're actually working on because the threading program does not do a roughing pass. It proceeds directly to threading and if you're cutting through a couple of millimeters of steel that doesn't turn out very well. Now the way it works with Gerbil Grew Lathe is it sends values to the y-axis. Uh, I already had it worked out for my rotary axis what the values would be uh, for uh, turning the rotary axis using the y and it has to be figured out for each lathe according to your micro steps and um, accounting for 360 degrees instead of just linear so the values here are quite large because of that uh, the step values for my rotary axis are approximately 53 millimeters per degree just how I have the pulleys set up. Anybody else's is likely to be different and that's quite a bit different than the step values for uh, linear axes. In any event you'll see quite large numbers go by in the y-axis and that's why. But otherwise it does work well and this would work with a uh, Arduino Uno card which can just do linear axes. At the present time there's not a provision for a rotary axis in Gerbil Grew Lathe, as you see. The, the uh, axis here is actually Y. It says, and uh, when you adjust this rotary button, it, it changes Y, but that's in a linear matter. In any event, the uh, threading program does work quite well with uh, something as small as six millimeters, like I'm doing here. You cannot have much metal sticking out of the chuck because it'll just bend. I'm using closed loop stepper motors and they seem to be quite capable of handling these loads. And since everything is started and we've uh, set our workpiece zero and we set our, our stock width at six millimeters which is the large diameter for this, you can just start it. In this case the default calculation for this is for six passes. You can adjust the speed of the pass up and down. You can adjust how far it withdraws, if at all, between passes. And it'll carry on until the thread is cut. And it works quite well. You can see these huge numbers going by in Y, but that's just a reflection of a linear distance that's being covered. I'll stop the program here and exit it. Send everything back to zero. The y-axis doesn't go to zero so you just click on the zero button. Sometimes it takes more than one time. But that's how threading works and it does work. It just depends on whether your machine is capable enough to do it. I would not do this with a open loop stepper motor because I would be worried about missing steps and then you'd get a imperfect thread being cut.
but uh, with a closed loop stepper motor such as I'm using and the, the uh, pulley ratios that I'm using it seems to work quite well. And now a short word about cutters. A flat high-speed steel at a 60 degree like this doesn't work very well in wood. A very sharp flat cutter like you might use on the wood lathe also doesn't work that well on a lathe like this. Typical metal cutters like this one really don't work. They're too blunt. So I've found the best success is with cutters made for aluminum like this 8 millimeter button cutter. You can see the edges are very sharp. And for fine work I found a specialized cutter. It's almost like a, a Z that has a 2 millimeter tip and straight sides that are raised and very sharp and originally meant for aluminum. So I've tried to present some basic features of Gerbil Crew Lathe in this video. I hope it is helpful to someone. Thank you for watching.